in the USA with uh, Peter Grandot, who made many experiments at MIT. He is in favor of Ampere, and I also, because I like Weber, and if I like Weber, I like Ampere, and so on, so on, so on. And when I did begin to work with Peter Granot, my, uh, I am a theoretician, I'm not an experimentalist. Peter Granot made many experiments, and I did work with him for one year. And I, I did go there to join force and try to calculate things in details and so on. The problem is com it's not trivial. Let me show the, just an example. As I said, suppose that we have a current flowing here, okay? And I calculate the force that the left half, half makes on the right half. If I calculate that with ampere, they repel with an another. This ampere tension. If I calculate with Grassmann, it is zero, no force. Uh, but integrally, they repel each other because of the Laplace Grassmann force. Two parts of the circuit they will repel each other via the Grassmann force. Not, not with Grassmann, because Grassmann is, the force is always orthogonal to the series. Yes, yes, but... Uh, so that there is no longitudinal no force with Grassmann. But it's integrally... But when, even when you integrate, because Grassmann is also a vectorial product. Grassmann is always a vectorial product. No matter the direction of the magnetic field, if you have a current here, and the magnetic field is here or here or here, the force will always be in an orthogonal plane because of this vectorial product. So no matter how <coughs> is the magnetic field created by other sources, the force on a current element is also always in a plane orthogonal to it. There will never be a longitudinal force with Grassmann. Maybe with Ampere, not with Grassmann. If you, but have, if you have a circular circuit, it tends to uh, extract, extract like that. Because the, okay. But not because of these uh, longitudinal forces, but because there are transverse no, forces yes. in all parts of the circuit, yes, 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 yes. Okay, but ready. not longitudinal ones. So, uh, when we calculate this, and th this is not trivial, it may be very trivial, but if you calculate with linear current yes, elements, yes. it explodes, goes to infinity. To calculate this, you either need to make in numerical integrations, surface or volume current elements, or you need to make four-fold or six-fold integrations, which was quite part of my work. So it's very complicated, it's not very simple. But, and then you get these results here, okay? You can get that. But so we, we might say, okay, and people make experiments and observe that the wire explodes. When you discharge a current in a wire, it breaks in many pieces, 50 pieces, and you discharge a capacitor bank. And Peter Grano and others thought, well, this is a proof of Ampere's tension. But the trick is, when you complete the circuit, I'm talking here about closed circuits, when you complete the circuit, the reminder of the circuit, what is read here, in this piece, exactly cancels the longitudinal force. It's amazing, but it happens. Mm -hmm. And it will appear a transverse force with Ampere, which will be exactly equal to Grassmann. Mm -hmm. And both of them agree with what you measure. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So unfortunately, this was the result of my part of my work. I didn't like it, but it came from the, because I did want, of course, that Ampere would be much better than Grassmann. I don't like Grassmann. But when you do that, the longitudinal component of Ampere's force disappears. And then we could also generalize this for arbitrary circuit. Let me show you a, another situation which also apparently shows a distinction between Ampere and Grassmann. And this goes, goes back to Ampere himself. Ampere did want to prove the, this repulsion between collinear current elements. And Ampere made an experiment like that, which is called nowadays Ampere's bridge or hairpin experiment. So what you have here is again a closed circuit. And you separate it in two parts, the support and the bridge. And here 
you can have either air and when you have a capacitor bank, bank and you close the switch you have arcs, electrical arcs here which close the circuit or you can have uh, mercury troughs here and there so this part is mechanically disconnected from this one and you can measure the force either statically with a balance or modern times they make uh, uh, electromagnetic impulse pendulum you have the two parts here and you have a one centimeter separation gap in air and you have a, here a capacitor bank in the switch and you close the switch you have arc here and there is a impulse in the other part and it goes up and down and you can measure the height it goes and you know the impulse it received and so on and so on and so on well when you calculate the force of the support on the bridge with ampere it agrees with experiment but not Grassmann so okay bingo here we have a proof that Grassmann is wrong and amperes is correct this was for instance uh, calculations presented by Paul Wesley a person which I also know personally but the problem is Grassmann's law does not comply with action and reaction for this reason you must also calculate to know the net force of, of the on the bridge the force of the bridge on itself it is crazy but it is like that with ampere you don't need because action and reaction when you calculate the force of the bridge on the bridge it is zero always no, no matter the the force and when you do that again amazingly then you get when you calculate also the force of the bridge on the bridge with Grassmann and add the force of the support on the bridge, they will agree exactly with Ampere and will also agree with experiment. Again, unfortunately. <laughs> and so, my personal conclusion is that with closed circuits, even when you calculate the force on a part of a circuit and so on, it is impossible to distinguish both expressions. Yes, I uh, I, but uh, Peter Granofers, with whom I worked, and Paul Wesley and so on, they don't agree. And, no, so, no, they don't and there also here uh, in France, we have uh, Rémi, Salmon, and others who make experiments with Ampere and so on, measure the force and so on. They, also tend to show or to agree that it is possible to prove experimentally with closed circuits that you can uh, distinguish the two expressions. I personally don't agree. We uh, published a, a whole book only last year here only on these uh, all of these calculations four-fold, six-fold integrations, and we also generalized this for circuits of arbitrary form. We presented proofs, algebraic proofs, geometric proofs, numeric proofs, and so on, that in circuits of arbitrary form, arbitrary geometries, and so on, they will always agree with one another. <coughs> Maybe there will be a possibility when we have open circuits. What I mean, with, now as we say, there is no open circuits. But we can have at least open mechanical circuits. Uh, I can have a capacitor with a large separation between the plates and I can discharge it. People say, well, there will be displacement currents here in the middle. Okay, but will these displacement currents uh, create forces on the circuits or not? How can you calculate that? No one knows that I know. And so the, the question, it's not yet uh, maybe with open mechanical circuits it will be possible to discuss more on these subjects so unfortunately to me uh, Ampere and Grassmann this is not the way to distinguish Weber and Lorentz we need another way so what I will show here is a clear distinction between the two theories which is also a very simple prediction suppose that I have here plastic material and I charge it in my hair 
So I have charge here. And I now with my hand, I accelerate it. Or I, I have a beam of electrons and I put a magnet. The electrons deflect, describe a circle, and so on. And you measure this Larmor radius and so on. So you accelerate charge. Now we bring the whole situation inside this closed room and we charge the walls and repeat the experiment. I make the same. We saw charge here and now I charge and I make the same thing. Put the magnet and deflect. Will it be a difference or not? Depend on the charge of the environment. Excuse me. So you are inside the charge sphere here, isn't it? You are yes. Yes, it's a Mikhailov experiment. Yes, I had a discuss. In the first case, you put zero charge outside yes. and accelerate, and you observe some effects. Mm -hmm. Now you charge the environment and you repeat the experiment. Will it be a change or not? Mm -hmm. Let us see first with Lorentz. This charge create electric field, but not the spherical shell. The okay. spherical shell inside creates no electric yes. and no magnetic field. So, according to Lorentz, the spherical charge will not create a force on the test particle. So, nothing will happen. Nothing should change. Because this test charge will not fill the environment. Okay? Nothing should change. But, if we calculate with Weber's expression, as you remember, Weber's law has three components. <coughs> Why is the electric field here? Newton proved that 300 years ago for gravitation. When you have a, a central force, which is 1 over r squared, when you integrate that, it is zero. The velocity component is also 1 over r squared. When you integrate that, you also get zero. But the last component is only 1 over r. So the Newtonian theorem that there is no force inside a charged distribution of matter will not be valid for this last component. When you integrate with Weber's expression, we get this expression here. The force that the charged spherical shell exerts on the test particle depends on the acceleration of the test particle in relation to the shell. Yes, okay. So this is a clear distinction between Weber and Lorentz and depends also on the product of the two charges and on the radius of the spherical shell. This comes from this last component of Weber's law when you integrate that. This um, expression by Weber can also be written like that. You can call it, this has the dimension of mass. So you can call it a Weberian mass. So this Weberian mass will be test charge potential, if you define the zero of potential of, of infinity, by 3c squared. Yes? Yes, excuse me. But when you, when you charge your spherical shell, you must uh, find this charge somewhere in the universe. Yes. What do you do with the rest of the charge? Does it uh, have some, uh, some influence on the, on the motion inside? It, it, when you when you use a classical electrodynamics, you're sure that inside uh, a conductor, nothing happens uh, in relation with what is uh, outside. In Weber's electrodynamics, is that uh, also true? Or no, not? because you have an expression here. Uh -huh. So th there will be an effect. Uh -huh. so, if uh, you are inside I the charge spherical shell and you accelerate the mm -hmm. charge, it will behave differently as in classical electrodynamics. Yes, but uh, the outside uh, charge, the minus Q, which you must have uh, yes. somewhere, you can suppose that does you it can have some influence? Yes, but you can you concentrate that in... Yes. But it's far away. Yes. So the contribution you may, you may 
ne forget about it. Uh, neglect, yes. Yes. You're sure. It's possible, yes, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, you can take two spheres it, it and you take cancel. the chart from mm -hmm. one it to the other. It will not cancel in general. Yes, I'm sure. Okay. So this is the main point here. So I'm trying now to show a clear distinction between Weber and Lorentz and to discuss if there are or not possibilities to see this effect experimentally. What could be an experiment? I will just show a very simple example. Suppose that we have electrons describing a circular orbit in a uniform magnetic field. First, there is no charge here. How can we calculate? With Lorentz, F equals MA. What is the F? The magnetic force, QVB. They are orthogonal to one another. The acceleration is centripetal acceleration. So the electron will describe a circular orbit with a certain frequency, which depends on Q, Q magnetic field, and the mass of the electron. Now you charge the spherical shell. What will happen? Nothing, according to Lorentz, because there are no force from the spherical shell on the inside, so the frequency will not change. Now we make the same. Zero charge here and the electrons describing this term we can also derive from Weber. Now you put a charge here and see what you get with Weber. With Weber you have an extra term here. This is the force of the spherical shell on the accelerated internal particle. It will be Weberian mass times acceleration. In this case, the centripetal acceleration will be like that. So this term is just like that. You can put it to the other side, and you get the same equation, but with a different mass. So the frequency now is different, because it depends on the amount of charge in the shell. So according to Weber, if you measure the frequency, the frequency should change depending on the amount of charge which is in the spherical shell. And this change of frequency will be proportional to the potential of the shell, if we choose the zero of potential at infinity. Okay? And in principle, you can measure this. What are the orders of magnitude for this effect? If you calculate that with uh, Weber, if you have as a test particle the electron, if you charge the spherical shell to 1.5 million volts, which is what we get in the Van der Graaff, typically, then the Weberian mass will be essentially the same value of the typical mass of the electron. So the effective mass of the electron will be twice as usual. So this is a huge effect, okay, okay. because this is 100% with voltage, voltage which you can obtain in the laboratory. It's not a tiny effect. You can detect that. If you have 150 kilovolts, the effect will be 10%. If you have 1.5 kilovolts, it will be 15 kilovolts, it will be 1%. 1.5 kilovolts, it will be 0.1 percent. In the experiments which we will show here, made by Mikhailov, he did work with 3 kilovolts. So the effect to be expected was two parts in 8,000. And he did have precisions of 0.1 parts in 8,000, enough to detect this. There is another way of deriving this effect, also with Weber's law. Yes, uh, you could do the Zeeman effect in this fashion. Yes, that's also possible. Zeeman effect inside a charged sphere. In principle, any effect which depends on the mass of the electron, you can repeat it here inside the spherical shell and see if you get or not uh, different results. 
provide that the test particle is charged. You can also derive that not working with forces but working with the potential. Weber's potential is like that. When you integrate for a test particle moving inside a spherical shell, the first Coulombian term, which will, will give a constant contribution, and the Weberian one, which will give you a contribution proportional to V squared. So, again, if you have conservation of energy with Weber, you have an extra term here, which you can join with this one and say that the test particle behaves with a different mass, depending on the potential of the spherical shell. Okay? Now I will show you experiments performed by Mikhailov. The first one, which I know, uh, trying to test this effect, was published by Mikhailov in the Annales de la Fondation Louis de Broglie, uh, 1999, three years ago. It's called the action of an electrostatic potential on the electron mass. Mikhailov worked essentially with this system here. He had, he had a spherical shell which he could uh, glass, but he put a conducting material around the glass and could charge it positively and negatively. And inside this spherical shell, he put a neon lamp, which made a, like in a camera, photograph camera, that when we have the flash, the, the flash blinks. And uh, so it's, it was essentially this system which he utilized. And he could measure the frequency of oscillation of the system. So in this case, you have acceleration of electrons here. And then he made the experiments with zero potential, positive potential, negative potential, and did measure the frequency of oscillation. Uh, said this was a, a Klein experiment. This spherical shell had a diameter of 10 centimeters, very Klein one. What he did get was the following. These are his results. So the, the variation of frequency as a function of the potential. Nothing should happen according to Lorentz. Because according to Lorentz, there are no effects of a charged spherical shell inside. But Mikhailov did obtain a linear variation of the frequency with the potential. And the order of magnitude coincide with the predictions of Weber's law. Not the exact numerical value, but the order of magnitude was the same. And even the sign, when the, he did change the potential to negative, the mass did change accordingly. So, but there is a crucial point here. In, this is a very, in principle, a very simple device which uh, exists in cameras, photographic cameras, and also in the street lights. When they turn on at dark, they utilize this system here, that you charge a battery, and when it reaches a threshold voltage, it discharge. So it's, a, in principle, a simple device. But there is a crucial point here. Mikhailov made a connection of his circuit with the spherical shell. If you see the spherical shell continues here, comes here, here, below, and there are connections here of his circuit with the spherical shell. I, the only person until now which I have heard that did try to repeat the Mikhailov's experiments was a, an American scientist called uh, Levitt, Creon Levitt. And he wrote to me in November of last year and told me that he did repeat this experiment and another one which Mikhailov published last year. 
and he did obtain positive results, agreeing with Mikhailov's experiments. Later on, he told me that when he did remove these two connections, the effect disappeared. disappeared. But up to now that I know, he didn't publish his results. But only for private information, he told me that he repeated and did agree, but later on, removing these two connections, the effect did not appear any longer. So the situation is not yet clear. The, the second experiment by Mikhailov was, in this case, he did utilize a discharge, glow discharge, like in a plasma. Last year, he published another paper in the foundation of the Annale de la Fondation Rue de Broglie and utilized a generator of, uh, like in a valve, Barkhouse effect. And he did also obtain a variation of the frequency proportional to the potential. In the second paper, in his drawings, he did not show a connection of the circuit with the spherical shell. But later on in private communications, he told me that he did have this connection. To him it was obvious, he didn't, he didn't need to show, he said. Once more, uh, this American Levitt repeat the experiment and in principle found the effect. And he removed, he didn't have the connection. In this case, he didn't have the connection. And he didn't find the effect in the second case, when it, he did repeat it. I asked the American, did you try the experiment with the connection? Until now, he didn't answer me. So, I don't know. I suggested him to do that. But in principle, the conclusions, the effect coincide with what was predicted. But maybe even when the effect, because there may be other theories giving rise to the same effect. I will only show here one example given by Professor Costa de Belregar. When discussing the first Mikhailov's paper, he said, question of the numerical factor. Instead of the Weberian one-third factor, Mikhailov obtained experimentally three halves of it. That is one over two instead of one over three. This is, I believe, the good result, a partition of the mutual energy between the sphere and the electron, the traditional writing of electrostatics. The idea here essentially is E equals mc squared. Now let us apply this equation for the potential energy. Normally in the textbooks they say that the potential energy does not have any effect. But Okay, let's apply it. Then you have the same order of magnitude, but with a different numerical coefficient if you only apply this directly, and if you apply equi equipartition of energy, one half. Then, uh, Professor Costa de continues. The Mikhailov experimental finding confirms the Broglie often expressed opinion that the electric potential is a measurable physical magnitude and must be expressed in the coulomb gauge. So, I am only showing this to indicate that there are, when the effect exists, there are, there were, and there may be other explanations for it. Obviously, Weber is not the only one. Here is a very good example of other possible explanations. But at the moment I must say that we, it's not yet clear the effect exists or not. We don't know. In principle it seems to me that it's very simple to repeat these experiments and they are crucial because